Donna Lynn Dela Cruz, who has immense experience in government and as well as in the private sector. She is the former press secretary for U.S. Senator Daniel Akaka, former deputy director of communications for Governor Abercrombie, former director of communications for the Hawaii Department of Education under Catherine Matayoshi, and for those of you who are old enough, she was also a reporter on KHON. I don't know if you folks remember that, but she was a reporter on KHON. And now she is the principal of her own consulting firm, DDC Consulting. We also have a very esteemed panel, including Lydie Burnell, coordinator for the Farm to School and School Garden Hui, Jason Brand, president of Brand Industrial Group, and Brand Industrial Group runs Kunia Country Farms and Kohana Rum. Russell Hatta, chairman and CEO of Y Hatta and Company, one of the largest food service distributors in the state of Hawaii and also largest distributor to the Department of Education, and Sean Tajima, complex area superintendent for the Hawaii State Department of Education. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and panelists to the stage. Well, thank you, Denise. I don't know if, um, geez, you I think you're worse than my brother saying how old I am up here. If, you, if you're old enough to remember, I think I'm the youngest one in this room. No, just kidding. <laughs> but no, um, uh, Randy, that was a, I have questions for you, but uh, you know, when you were starting off, I thought, thank goodness we're gonna have this panel. You was drawing some dark clouds, but there is hope, people. I think that there is hope, right? You, I heard you say it can be done. So I, I'm looking forward to this. Denise already talked about some of the folks up here. We're going to dive right into this topic because it's so important. Mahalo for being here. I see some ranchers and I see some farmers. So um, let's get into it. So the first person we're going to kind of say, tell us more. You know, Denise already told you who's on. And so Lydie, why don't you tell us what you do at the Hawaii Garden? Um, I guess what it is, well, we'll dive in there. But tell us why you are here and what you're excited about. What was it that Randy said that made you kind of say, oh, I'm excited to be here tonight. Great, thank you so much, and aloha kako. My name is Lydie Bernal, and I coordinate Hawaii's statewide farm to school network called the Hawaii Farm to School Hui. It's a program of Hawaii Public Health Institute, which is a nonprofit organization. I came into this work about 16 years ago as a garden educator. So I was working for a local nonprofit, Kokua Hawaii Foundation, and we were piloting one of the first farm to school programs in Hawaii called Aina in Schools. What I got to do was go from school to school, um, initially starting with five elementary schools, and teach gardening to elementary school students. And it completely changed my life, seeing the joy um, that they had being in the garden. Um, and that passion that I found for that work drives me to this day. So in 2014, I became the coordinator of the Hawaii Farm to School Hui, which is, a, again, a statewide network that formed in 2010. And since then, we've been working with public-private partners across the state. There are five island-level networks. And we coordinate with state departments of agriculture, education, and health, the University of Hawaii, uh, and county governments to strengthen the farm to school movement, which includes school gardens and farms, education and school food improvement. So one of the things that we strongly advocate for is that the educational piece, piece um, involving growing food, tasting it in the classroom, meeting local farmers and chefs, and then finally having it served to students in the cafeteria has to go very much hand in hand um, so really, you know, thankful to be here and part of this conversation. Thank you for being here. And next we have Jason, who's president of Brand Industrial Group, Inc. When I talked to him the other night about what, it, what is it, it's big. Get it? Big Inc. So you're doing big things at Big Inc. So thank you for being here. Tell us about it. Uh, thank you and aloha to everybody. It's great to be up here. Um, I moved to Hawaii 14 years ago, actually uh, from Japan. Uh, where I used to run one of the bigger investment banks. And I came to Hawaii and decided, how do I get involved and engaged in this community, my new community and home? And my wife and I and our family decided to do it through the land. So we became farmers with three tenants. One, we had to grow our food locally. We had to grow it sustainably. 
and we had to grow with enough size and scale that we were price competitive to California or to imports. Because there are two things that I think as we talk about 30% by 2000, by 2030 or 50% by 2050, it's Hawaii needs to have enough scale in our farming communities to supply it, but not at today's prices. It's got to be at reasonable prices to what the market is. Because the while we talk about the DOE as a big buyer, $45 million worth of produce buyer, right? they're also budget constrained on the other side. So if Hawaii's farmers can't find scale and price competition, right, then it's hard to go to the consumer of it and say, hey, buy my product that's locally grown, it just costs you twice as much, right? That's not fair. And so the real thing that, or I, I guess the partnership or the, the idea that as we move forward will be, farms will find scale to provide food locally. Customers like the DOE would provide consistency for farms to scale into. And the farmer then needs to commit to provide enough scale to reduce food prices for the island. So three constituents benefit from the DOE program. One is students get more nutritious locally produced food. Two, farmers get more consistent clients and the ability to grow and turn ag workers into more permanent type jobs. And three, the community at large benefits because prices for locally produced food should come down with scale. So three, three stakeholders will actually grow even though it's obvious that there are only two but the really three, the community becomes a big beneficiary uh, if this is a successful program. So chairman and CEO of Waihata and Company, and you heard Russell say, uh, Randy say that, Russell, you guys are really the ones helping DOE get there. So what did you think about what Jason said in terms of those three elements and what you guys do? Because um, I, I heard kind of a call to action from Randy that you guys are going to work on a relationship to as you guys go forward and I'm sure the fact that you've been supplying so much you must be thinking about the challenges ahead hello is it working <laughs> okay aloha everybody aloha. I'm Russell Hata and I'm the CEO of Y Hata and Company I've been studying this uh, school food service thing from the time I was five years old in elementary school, Lilio Kalani in Kaimaki, watching the kids stuff the tomatoes and whatever they didn't want to eat into the milk cartons. I think we all experienced that. To me, that's one of the biggest shames because the amount of dollars that is wasted at the schools is staggering. So formally, we've gotten involved in uh, schools when the federal commodity program with the government negotiated with the manufacturers and sent it to us and we distributed to the schools automatically. Everything coming from the mainland. Currently, uh, the DOE goes out for bid for most of the items. Again, if we get a bid, we bring the big majority in from the mainland. So that's a uh, that's, uh, obviously a huge challenge that we're trying to overcome in Hawaii. So I'm getting kind of old in my old age. So what was the question? <laughs> You're kind of answering it already in terms of that challenge, right? So there are three things that Jason had said that the schools provide. A customer, you have an ongoing customer. What was the second and third? <laughs> Sweet. So it, it was... Um, it's basically like full circle, right? With the DOE as a constant customer, you're going to be the supplier. There's a demand. And so what am I missing here, Jason? Well, the, the three, I guess two ways to say it. The, the three stakeholders in the DOE project, or 30 by 30, is the students benefit, the children benefit by more nutritious, fresh food. That's the obvious one. Second is the farmers benefit by having a consistent customer, consistent demand to scale up their farms and grow into, right? And it's a big customer, it's a $45 million customer. Um, and then the third beneficiary, if farmers achieve scale, is the community at large because food prices in Hawaii then should fall because you have scaled farms. Right now there are really only two big scaled farms in the islands. So going, going to the challenge, you were asking about the challenges, right? Before I get there, 
I believe that the schools can definitely purchase local products. I think it's a necessity for the state to move forward on sustainability, food sustainability. Um, there are a couple big challenges. I think the first biggest one is food safety. And I'll tell you a real quick story. One of my man, as a distributor, I wanted to help food sustainability. So I wanted to buy from the local farmers and sell it to our customers. Until one day, one of my managers on the big island got meningitis. He was out for one year with major headaches, uh, can't get up in the morning. And they, they identified the source as a worm that was in the lettuce he bought locally. And at that point, that's when I realized the importance of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which the feds implemented, I think was in 2019 or something like that. Uh, huge problem in Hawaii. Um, we have one guy here, Kevin Kennedy. He has a company that helps farmers. He has, I believe, 17, no, 13, 13 certified farmers. There's over 7,000 farmers in the state. And if you look at all the certified farmers, there's about 25 or 30 that are certified food safety. So I think that's the first big hurdle. Um, the Food Modernization Act, they, they control everything from growing to harvesting to production. And I think the next biggest hurdle is efficiently getting the product to the schools from the farmers. You have a whole bunch of 7,000 farmers, a whole bunch of small little guys, and they cannot deliver to a bunch of schools. So I think Randy's idea, where did he go? <laughs> I know he's here somewhere. Uh, oh, he's right here. <laughs> Like I said, I'm getting very old in my old age. <laughs> so anyway, the centralized kitchen, I think, is a, a great concept that can really expedite us getting to the point where we can supply, um, purchase the farm-grown food so and get it to the schools. Um, the third big one would basically be teaching. Originally, I thought they were going to do it by cafeteria. Each cafeteria is going to do it. But... Uh, that would be a challenge if you did do it. That would be a big challenge. But anyway, there are a lot of challenges, and, but I do believe it's very possible, um, and I'll help any way I can as far as on the efficiency of distribution side, because that's been a problem. I've been trying to raise my hand to the government for years now, and nobody, nobody heard. But recently, they started talking to me about it. So. Anyway. <laughs> no, thank you for that. And, you know, I was talking with Kaz, or Complex Area Superintendent Tajima, last night about the issue of, you know, you, you talk about worms. And when I was at the Department of Education in the communications office, a child would take a picture, and this happened on the Big Island, with a small snail that was on a piece of lettuce, sends it to the mom, the mom then sends it to the media, and then all of a sudden we've got what we would call a communications crisis. Because now it, it turns into, oh, the kids are going to get sick and all this. These are from, it's a, from a local farm. So, you know, it's one of those things where this is about education, right? You're going to have bugs out there. And I'm not saying that, that that's not something that we just turn a blind eye to. But how can we educate kids and not be afraid of this and say, oh, good, this is great that you found this. Now let's talk about that, right? So I had a great conversation with, with Sean. So he has been a principal. Um, a longtime educator and now complex area superintendent for the Campbell and Kapolei, which is a huge, huge area. So tell us about some of the schools out there and how, how you're able to feed because, you know, Randy talked about one of your schools where not too many of them are taking their lunch there. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Um, speaking from the Campbell and Kapolei complex area, we have all of the schools in the Eva and Kapolei region, so 18 schools total. We have two high schools, uh, big high schools, Campbell High School and Kapolei High School. Uh, we have four middle schools and 12 elementary schools in our area. So as many of you know, Campbell High School is the biggest school in the state. They have over 3,000 students right now. Uh, their cafeteria alone has 30 staff members. So just to put it in perspective, a small elementary school faculty is about 30. So. Uh, that's just in the Campbell cafeteria. Um, 
we're the fastest growing area, while the state enrollment is projected to decline over the next six years. We're the only complex area on Oahu that's projected to grow. So they keep, housing developments keep coming up in our area, both in Eva and in, in Kapolei. So we're projected to open actually five more schools within the next uh, time that got pushed back because of COVID. So probably within the next 10 and 20 years. So we're gonna uh, bring up a high school, a middle school and three more elementary schools. So lots of development, lots of potential in the area. And for that reason, I work closely with uh, A.S. Tanaka next to me. Um, a lot of potential that we're looking at in our area because of all the developments coming up. We just opened a brand new school in East Kapolei called Honu'uli Uli Middle School. Uh, they have a beautiful cafeteria, so lots of potential there. I know Randy has been looking at that cafeteria as potentially uh, absorbing the, the special meals diets for students. Uh, and of course, the, the land where East Kapolei High School is supposed to come up, which is Diamond Head um, of UH West Oahu, so Diamond Head of Kualakai Parkway. There's a parts of the land there. So just a lot of potential in our area because of the, the growth. So it's exciting uh, for us to consider a centralized kitchen with our staffing issues um, and also the idea of farm to, farm to school to promote our, our local economy. So a lot of potential in our area. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, now we want to turn it back to the potential and why we're doing this. So Jason, you said the kids, they can eat healthy. Right, that's a big thing. So Lydie, tell us about Hawaii Garden to cafeteria. How do, how do we make sure that the kids maybe want to go into the farming workforce? Like Randy pointed out, no one wants to be a farmer. So how do you spark that interest? Well, that is one thing that I would have to respectfully and completely disagree with, that young people do want to farm. And what we've seen in the last five years or so is a major growth in the interest in farmer training programs. I think there's a lot of opportunity for more local research to be done. Is it because these kids had gardens when they were in elementary school? Um, we have been tracking the numbers of school gardens over the years, and we've seen that number increase each year Prior to COVID, 85% of public schools had gardens. So K through 12 DOE schools, about over 200 garden programs. The HUI has done quite a bit of work to offer professional development to teachers. How do you use a garden as a classroom? We know that interest is there among teachers, among students. I personally have seen, again, the joy that students have in learning. That's learning engagement. That's reduced absenteeism, that's increased academic achievement, and it's increased preference for fresh fruits and vegetables. That's exactly what we need when we start serving more local in the cafeterias. Thank you very much. And, and if that's, I could, that's wonderful that the program's growing. <laughs> Thank you, yes. And one of the specific programs that's been piloted, um, when the DOE hired a farm to school coordinator um, around 2017, um, there's also was an effort in Department of Agriculture. So back then, um, they got together and said, many schools have wanted to serve food from their garden and farm in their cafeteria. That's called garden to cafeteria. There are many school districts around the country doing the same. So we brought in a consultant from Slow Food USA who had written the garden to cafeteria toolkit following good agricultural practices. So these are standards that farmers use in commercial production and making them appropriate, using the appropriate ones for school campuses. Over three years, we piloted the Hawaii Garden to Cafeteria program in partnership with the Department of Education, Health, Agriculture, and CTAR, as well as community partners. So this program is available to schools and it's been piloted on five islands at 12 public and charter schools. And again, it allows schools to serve food from the garden in the cafeteria following a food safety protocol with logs and standard operating procedures. It's training kids how to become farmers. You know, if that's, this is the food safety that we're talking yeah. about. These protocols are in place. Thank you very much. And Jason, kind of talk to us from your perspective, the concept of a value 
added producer, right? So if kids are having interest in this, what would you tell them that they need to know from an example of what you're doing now with aquaponics, for example? Sure, I guess we'll tie in the, the school's interest in creating farmers and then value added. Just for clarity, I, I guess my family, we have two types of farms here on Oahu. And we farm in Kunia, in Haleiwa, and in Wahiwa. I'm sorry, Wailua. Um, we have one farm, which is Kunia Country Farms, which is a big provider of leafy greens as well as fish. That tilapia species that Randy was loving. The, uh, <laughs> we like to go by the Japanese name for Izumi Dai, which is uh, a little bit higher class tilapia. Um, the, anyway, that's farming for food consumption, really kind of what we're talking about as we talk about feeding the population around Hawaii or feeding the cafeterias of the DOE. There's also the educational side of it, which you can farm for consumption. At Kohana Farms and Kohana Distillers, we farm for manufacturing, for export, right? So in this case, we're using Hawaii's agricultural product to create something. In our case, it's a very high end. Only 2% of the world's rum is made this way, Hawaiian agricultural style rum. And not to toot Kohana's horn a little bit, but Forbes magazine in February said there's 21 must-try rums for the 21st century. Only two rums out of that 21 were, were from the United States. And ranking at number nine was our one from Hawaii, Kohana, Hawaiian agricultural rum. So, but what's neat about that is you have a product or the ability to take farming and convert it. In this case, it was sugarcane, right? Something that Hawaii knows very well. And I'm not talking about the sugarcane plantation from 100 and 200 years ago. I'm talking about the Hawaiian varieties that came with the first voyagers to Hawaii, the first settlers from 1,000 years ago. And that's what's been converted into this very high-end rum. So what's neat is there's chemistry in distilling, there's agronomy and farming. There's all kinds of irrigation and waterworks. As you work your way through the different aspects of farming operations from manufacturing or food consumption. So there's lots of ways to play value added and they all have an educational as well as an economic or social goal. So it's quite interesting. And so on that note, let's talk about geography. Where do we get most of our food from? Russell, you, you pretty much know it, you, you talked about you know, where we can get our food, the vulnerabilities of our farmers. So where would you say that we get our, our produce or food from? So almost everything coming into Hawaii comes from the mainland. Uh, across from the East Coast to the West Coast, everything is shipped by truck normally to the West Coast. From the West Coast, it jumps on the, on the ships to come here. Stuff from Asia goes to the West Coast first and then gets turned around and shipped here. So uh, we really get the, the worst of the worst as far as transportation cost. You know, it's tough. So if we're, if the DOE is the biggest customer, right? And you've seen it from a, just a local, and we all try to pride ourselves in saying we're gonna buy local, we're looking at you know, other islands. And you know, Randy, you talked about what's here on Oahu. Of course, we have Mahipono expanding on other islands as well. So, in terms of that, it's kind of like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to reach not only the mandate that the schools have, but the mandate that the state has? How, what's the challenge that you see our ranchers and our farmers? When I jumped back into this food sustainability, I kind of veered away from it for a while because I looked at it, it was such a big challenge. Right. But when I came back in about a year ago, six months ago, I realized that with the governor's initiative to hit those targets 30% by 2030 and 50 by 2050. And I saw how many different buckets of organizations and people and company that were pursuing it. I said, it's just a matter of time. You know, it's gonna take a while for uh, efficiencies to set in, for realities to set in, but uh, for example, Randy's project, is, is, you know, it's not an easy project, it's huge. But he'll get there because the vision is there and the interest of doing it, accomplishing it is there. So on that note, Sean, if you could talk about, or Kaz Tajima, if you could talk about um, 
how do you inspire not only our students to want to eat, but you know, the passion that Randy saw at Mililani, for example. Um, when I was at the DOE, they were just starting, I was talking to Lydi last night about out in um, Kohala, and how there was this shift of change of the staff that suddenly they had to cook with Aina based, right? So they're used to getting all of this food, and now they have to look at what's around them and create all new menus. I'm, I, I know that after a while, they loved it, and the passion grew. But not every complex has the same side, kind of like, okay, let's talk to this farmer or this rancher. So what do you do? So I think that's the secret code to break for, for everything is uh, preparing meals that students enjoy eating. Um, and it differs from every, every ca cafeteria and complex area. Um, and you know, on a, on a personal level, I kind of wanted to dispel the myth about school lunch being bad because for me, I ate school lunch for years when I was at school level, and I, I really enjoyed it. And you know, granted, there are certain lunches daily that you like more than others, like, like anything else in our life, but I really enjoyed school lunch. But I guess we also have to cater to the, the different audiences within the students. But I think garnering that student voice uh, for input on the menu is going to be really important. At one of, uh, in fact, at Campbell High School, there was a student group led by a uh, teacher and a club leader. So the teacher was an environmental science teacher who taught juniors and seniors, and she partnered with uh, the Green Sustainability Club Advisor. They had a group of about 30 kids who were interested in um, promoting more, uh, a better menu for schools. Uh, so they met you know, outside of, of school hours to, to talk about this, and uh, they even ran a study on the, the food waste, because they were Everybody's appalled by how much food that we waste. And so, you know, they were solution-based. They met, they brainstormed. They actually measured the amount of food that was wasted at Campbell. They noted the types of food that were wasted, the types of foods that kids uh, consumed. And so their next step was to really survey the kids on, to get their voice on what kind of menu items would be more attractive to them. So the group actually presented to me uh, what their study was, what their findings were, and what their next steps were. So we're all excited. Um, and while I have a lot on my plate, I was excited that this was generated by students. They were being solution-based, and they had a next step to take. So I wanted to support them all I could. It was about a week after that meeting that COVID hit, and that, 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 that was put on the back burner. But there are efforts being taken uh, to garner student voice to stay within the nutritional guidelines and yet come up with menu items that are more attractive for students to eat. And a lot of our high schools, right, have culinary programs where that's kind of exciting. Correct. So how do you pair that up with the other side of that? You know, I went to Lelehua and I mean, we had champion FFA kind of folks there. Um, so, you know, I don't know about you east side people, but out in Wahiwa, we had it down, right? So, but really, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you say, okay, we're gonna grow this and then switch it to the culinary side and make that passion, make it totally stu student driven. So that can be an interesting partnership in high schools depending on the type of programs that they have. So our high schools do have culinary programs and they also have ag programs. So that's a important partnership. Uh, one program at Campbell High School again, uh, they had a terrific ag teacher. Some of you may have heard of him. His name was Derek Chow. He was there for at least 30 years. And he, he did it all over there. So he grew the food, taught the kids how to grow the food. Um, he taught them how to prepare the food. So he cooked the food. Through that process, he would teach them, you know, the nutritional value of the foods. And, of course, they ate the food together. And he, he gave them many different options on how to prepare those foods. So he gave them the gamut of how to grow it and how to prepare it and how to enjoy it. Um, unfortunately, he retired. So it's hard to find special people like that, especially in the field of education, because people with a, a strong farming background or a strong culinary background don't go through the College of Education. So it's very hard to attract someone with that background knowledge who has a, the skill of teaching. So I think that's one way that hopefully we can partner with uh, community groups that have that knowledge base and can partner with schools to promote that education for kids. You know, when you think about taste, it was the, whenever I'd visit schools, baked chicken and pizza. They love those two items. And um, I don't know, nutritional values. So 
Lighty, how do we how do we add that element in, into that? I'm not saying it wasn't nutritional, but they left a lot on the plate, but the chicken was gone and the pizza was always great. So what's the balance there? It definitely is about student voice in terms of what's being served. I think it helps if agriculture programs are involved in growing what goes onto the plate for their peers, major student and peer-to-peer -peer engagement there. Uh, there's a lot of research behind school garden-based education and nutrition education changing student palate. Um, so, you know, we've seen that with a Harvest of the Month program that we have available here. Um, really, there's educational materials, uh, but we always say that you, if they plant it and grow it in their garden, try it in their classroom and learn about the nutritional benefits, there's a lot of work going on in this area that really needs to go hand in hand with what's happening on the school food side. I also wanted to mention um, what Kaz Tajima was saying about um, agriculture education, yeah, and CTAR and College of Ed. So in fact, in 2015, the Senate passed a resolution requesting CTAR to look at preschool to post-secondary agriculture education. How do we create this pathway starting from preschool through post-secondary education? And they met over three years. One of the things that was envisioned was a CTAR to College of Ed, three plus two or four plus one. How about we get students with a background in agriculture becoming teachers? And so that's, that hasn't happened yet, but it's something we want to work toward. We're developing a learning garden on the College of Education campus to train pre-service teachers in using a garden as an outdoor classroom. Those are some of the things that we're working on. Thank you. You know, one of the other things that Kaz Tajima brought up was the food waste, right? And it was raised a lot right now. So Jason, what do you think we can do about that? Is there something, another element um, that we can add, you know, on Randy's plate to, to help with our, our, our food waste? Well, it, it's interesting. I'm involved in a lot of conversations about what I'll say is the, the connectivity of businesses in terms of one person's waste is another one's treasure. And the same thing is here. There's a lot of experiments currently going on around sources of fish food in order to develop the aquaculture industry in Hawaii. And a lot of it stems around from different types of waste or insects and things that we can grow. But whether we're talking about a child learning to farm, learning the nutritional value and becoming a doctor or nutritionalist, or a business learning that they have a byproduct that they don't need, and another business finding an input for their manufacturing process that they don't have to actually fly in or ship in, right? The world is all about connectivity. And we, we talk about students or everyone like, when I view the, the earth or why do I farm, it's about connectivity. I think people are looking in general to connect to things, whether it's to people or to the planet or to the food they grow or to an experience they had, but that, that word connection and the same thing is coming up as we talk about food waste. You can incorporate it into connection. So food waste from the cafeteria may end up becoming tomorrow's fish food for that tilapia that's becoming the next year's fish sticks, right? So that circle will exist, and I think it will take the entrepreneurs and the business people and the politicians and the general community to go ahead and force those dots together. And when Hawaii can make those connections and empower people to drive those businesses together. And trust me, there's a lot of red tape along connections because everyone's like, oh, I don't want the liability of that. I don't want to get sued. But when you can power through it to create the right ideal, right, then this system works better, then Hawaii works better, then the world works better. And so I think we'll see that food waste find its way back on the menu in a different form. Here, here. So Russell, you know, talking about progress, right? You've seen a lot. Where are we with technology, and how does that help us reach our goal? Kind of maybe enlighten us in terms of what you've seen. You know, it's not just the, the farmer of maybe when you were five years old, but what do you see now, and what have you seen in terms of that progression, and where do you see us going? We've got a long way to go on that one. Um, there's a lot of technology. I was just talking to Kevin Kennedy back there about um, being able to 
let the distributors and ultimately the customers know, whether it's a restaurant or a grocery store or a consumer, of what products will be available when and at what price. That's all technology driven. It has to be a, a way to capture that information. Um, I've always wanted to create a, a website to connect the buyers, the growers with the buyers. And uh, it's, I think a lot of these things are in motion. There, there's models out there that are working. Uh, it's just for us to catch up uh, with the time. You know, I see these, uh, when I'm scrolling I was on, on phone, I see like, you can make your own lettuce, just buy this, this tower and I can be my own farmer, right? <laughs> I don't know if every school can do that, but do you see that type of things that, that schools could maybe adopt or, or where are we going with, with this type of farming technology as a producer and distributor? What's feasible for Hawaii? I think anything's feasible. Uh, the, the biggest challenge we have is land and water. Mm -hmm. You know, the government allocates only X amount of actual usable agricultural space. Um, I met Jason Brand through this guy, Dean Okimoto, who started Nalo Farms a long, long time ago. He was one of the original farm-to-table growers. And um, Jason probably has one of, he's been researching this thing for 12, 13 years now, one of the most efficient agricultural process. Uh, is it aquaculture or <laughs> was, it, was it aquaculture? Aquaponics. Aquaponics, I always get that mixed up. So anyway. Uh, he wants to, he's looking for 30 acres to do something that's on a scale where it can be, make sense uh, economically. And we just can't find the space. We can't find the land. You know, it's, it's tough. And then a lot of the technology, you know, is expensive for the normal farmer. Right. So maybe co-ops or maybe, you know, something where we can get the people together and combine their um, buying power could possibly make it happen. You know, it's such a complex issue when you see the headlines like schools need, you know, only take this much percentage of local food, and yet we're trying really hard. And then you hear the challenges from, you know, our archaic technology, the fact that we can't actually produce these things. You know, Sean, I, I kind of want to start to wrap this up. Where do we go with our students? You said COVID hit when you had this big idea. We're keeping our kids in school. How can we make sure that this is at least top of mind for them with, with everything on their plate right now? How do we say this is important? You know, consider this. Yeah, I think this time presents a great opportunity because one thing, there's nothing good about COVID, but one offshoot benefit of COVID is that it's forced us to look at education differently. It really turned it upside down. It wasn't a subtle difference, you know, to go from in-person to a complete shutdown to complete distance learning, which we've never done before, to a blended model where half were coming and half weren't coming, and then to return fully in person this year with, you know, knowing we had thousands of cases out there uh, has been a challenge. And I think that uncertainty of what's gonna happen next is always looming out there. But I think the, the good part is, is it's forced us to look at things differently. So for cafeterias, is no different. I think the, Innovative idea was innovative for us, but as Randy said, you know, the centralized kitchen is not new, is not a new concept. It'll be new to Hawaii, but it's not a new concept. Um, I think that's a, a great idea and a, a very important one, and I think it goes hand to hand with the farm to school, because I don't think it would be a huge challenge to do farm to school with individual cafeterias, as Russell was alluding to, to earlier. So I think to combine that into a massive centralized kitchen can make that a reality with adequate uh, equipment, adequate staffing. You know, as we know, to have farm to school um, is, is scratch cooking compared to what we're doing now. So it, it is more labor intensive, require more staff, more training, different kinds of equipment, uh, but it can be done. And I think it'll alleviate the staffing issue that we have right now. You folks have seen it all over the news, how there's a teacher shortage, there's a sub-teacher shortage. Cafeteria is no different. In my complex area, in 18 schools, we have about 100 cafeteria positions. 25 of those are vacant right now. So that's like a quarter of the caf uh, workers are, are unfilled, being covered by substitutes, or you know, other people are absorbing those duties. So 
you know, when I spoke to Randy earlier about the centralized kitchens he visited on the mainland and saying that these kitchens cook for 100, over 100 schools and have 35 workers there, um, that's a huge answer to our, our staffing shortage right now. So um, I think, you know, right now it, it is a tough time because we're so in flux and we don't know what's going to happen next, but the situation has forced us to look at education and every aspect about education, not just the teaching and all of our operational functions, look at it differently and be uh, more efficient. Do you have a mic? Okay, awesome. Yep. I'm going to ask you the final question before we open oh it up boy. to the audience. Um, so you've heard this great discussion, um, and a lot of work is, is being done, right? So how could the community get more involved with supporting Hawaii's farm to school movement? And this question goes to, to uh, Assistant Superintendent Tanaka. Leave me alone. <laughs> this is not that difficult. Let me tell you, it is not that difficult. Right? We just need to be single-minded in our purpose. There's funding there. Building a building is not an issue. I think you need to focus on being a free marketeer. The market forces will dictate our success. Right? If we cannot compete with the product coming out of the state, from outside the state, we will fail. We need to be competitive. We need to serve the product to our consumer, who is the student. We got, a, we got 180,000 customers every day that we can serve a meal to, and we get paid for it. But you got to make it a good product. It's one. You got to, the efficiency of the, the marketplace will determine our success. There's no you know, I was talking to Ms. Farias over there. He called me early on in the game, and he said, Randy, I got 100,000 pounds of beef. I need to do something with it. Unfortunately, school was out. Okay, but I figured out a way. We were only serving beef once a week. Now imagine, and using half a million pounds, imagine if we serve beef twice a week. Right? So it's all about skill, exactly what Jason said. You cannot, you know, gardening is great from an educational standpoint. But to be a successful business, to be a successful farmer, you need scale. That's the reality of the marketplace. And I gotta get a little, give a little script for this guy. You know, his rum business. I met him when he flipped rum to hand sanitizers. Right? Now that's an entrepreneur that makes and takes advantage of the marketplace. That's the kind of mindset we have to have if we're gonna play this game. So it, this is not an impossible task. It is not that hard to do. But it's going to take, my shot clock is one year, right? Because if we get the bills passed and the funding for it and we build this centralized kitchen outside of Wahewa, we're going to win this game because we can improve the meal quality. That's not hard. Now. Not everybody in food service is going to be a Royce, right? But neither do I want my kid to be wearing the hairnet working in the cafeteria. And that's going to change. I talked to a guy named Art Kimura when I first started on this journey. I said, Art, I need a robot to pick a fresh strawberry and a fresh tomato. He said, why? So I told him what we were trying to do, right? Automate, automate our, our harvesting process. Said, no problem. Come with me to Japan. There's an expo three football fields in size, every egg robot you can imagine. They've developed the, the picking of the ripe tomato. They've developed the, the strawberry picker. I said, okay, the, it's out there. It's out there, right? Inventory management. So, so it's not an impossible task. I kind of joke, leave me alone, but in some ways, yeah, leave me alone. I'll, I'll, we'll go work this thing out. Thank you. Thank you, and a, a big round of applause for our panelists. We still, we want to open this up to questions from the audience. Okay, my question to you is, okay, you, you guys are training them for GAP, yeah? Um, why don't you go, go further and maybe hook up with Kevin Kelly and get a harmonized GAP program started at the public schools? Because Kevin just told us tonight, and Doral here from, is here from KS, that Kamehameha Schools, two of their campuses have just 
um, gotten certified for, for harmonized gap. But I think part of going forward and teaching these kids on, on farming and everything else, it's a key component in, in, in uh, food safety, that they learn and, and learn how important that is. So, you know, I, I, I'm just putting that to you that um, I think um, you guys might want to talk and see if you can do that. Absolutely. We welcome partnerships. Um, it's about connectivity, coordination, and relationship building. So thank you for that. Um, Lydie, we've talked before about, about farm to school. And, you know, it's going to take a lot for all of us to come together around this. There's federal law with FISMA about how food safety is done. But I really want to address Jason's three criteria. I'm going to add a fourth here. The fourth is that for every 10% of import substitution into the state, we generate $300 million of economic churn, including another $5 million in tax base. And so it, working together, we, we build each other up. And so it, it's just lovely to see how we're all getting on the same page. In the last two years, especially with COVID, when, you know, farmers were abandoned for a while there, and we had our food hubs realign supply channels to get food into CSA programs and things like that, it, it was beautiful. But we still need to focus on increasing production and building our resiliency. And I continue to advocate for mid-scale aggregation facilities where 30 or 50 food safety certified farms sell to an aggregator that can provide the food that Russell needs to sell to DOE. And so that we build these supply chains locally so that if a disaster happens, they continue to buy from local farms. The aggregator decides, does it go to a food bank? Does it continue to go to schools? To what? But we don't have those local supply chains now at a scale that the state needs to, you know, be confident about any form of resiliency. So congratulations to the panel. I, I love this, Denise. Thank you very much for having this, and best to you all. Thank you. That's a great segue to this question that came in. And, and Russell, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you, you don't mind answering this. It's um, our processed products from the mainland, such as, you know, the corn, the soy, those processed products, um, they're subsidies by the USDA. So how do we level the playing field here for our farmers? Bottom line is scale. You know, you gotta have the economies of scale to compete. Uh, but really, when, if you look at the whole overall value, the nutritional value, you know, the, the freshness, um, the, what is that when you, all the fuel, that it costs to bring it over the ocean and everything. There's a lot of benefits for buying local. So even if the price is a little higher, I think we can handle it. But uh, basically, you, ha you have to be efficient. You have to make it efficient. We need processing centers, though, mid-scale ones all over the place. On that note, I, I want to ask a question of Jason. It goes back to, to pricing, right? So um, how, how can we do that? How can we? Or do we think we need to raise our prices? What's, what's that price solution? The, uh, so when we started farming here, we looked at the market and said, what can we grow in enough size that Hawaii has enough demand for? Because there's a lot of good ideas out there, but you can't find scale, right? And so you can't necessarily make it work. We chose leafy greens because they're refrigerated import and perishable. They're also fairly easy to grow. So in the world of lettuce, 25 cents a pound is added due to transportation from California. Okay, so we all know it's expensive to, land is more expensive in, in Hawaii, and electricity is more expensive, water is more expensive, labor is more expensive. So the question is, is can you, even though your costs are higher, make back that 25 cents per pound that California has to pay to ship over here? So for domestic food consumption, right, shipping works to your advantage, particularly if it's a perishable product 
or refrigerated product. And so farmers have to think about maybe that's a place to start with regard to our partnership with the school or whoever it might be. Right? I may not choose to grow corn or soybeans, which are more subsidized uh, and don't have to be brought over necessarily in a refrigerator. Right? So picking your products is a way to start. Um, the, the big fun thing about what's going on here with the DOE becoming a large buyer, or the 30 by 30 concept, and I'm going to give uh, an example in the world of sanitizer that, that helped our company. We started making hand sanitizer because it was the right thing to do for our company in the early stages of the pandemic. Right? So in March 2020, we were the first company to get FDA registered and say, hey, there's no sanitizer in the hospitals, let's fill that need, right? And we donated it all in the beginning. Um, the state came in and gave us a very large order through HIEMA, the Emergency Management Agency, and basically gave us a large steady state order. And then they began to give it out to DOE and to uh, Health and Human Services and through all the organizations. Because we knew we had a steady buyer and just so you know, we sold it to the state at less than normal prices before the pandemic for sanitizer, even though sanitizer was going at three, four times the normal price. Because our goal was, again, to be a community player. But because we can, had a steady state buyer, we scaled into it. And all of a sudden, had the ability to make more sanitizer than the state wanted and ended up giving it to the community, to Kapuna, to the hospitals, and places well beyond where that initial contract started. The same thing is possible with DOE moving into a large food buyer for all the local farms, right? And if they choose food and, and crops that one might have a cost advantage because of shipping, two that will find its way through the, the passion of students and the menu that's chosen by the school system, then all of a sudden you have scaled farmers and economics that work for everybody. On that note, I have a question here, and I think this will, will go to you, um, AS, Assistant Superintendent yes. there. So, to me, land, labor, water, essential parts of farming. The state owns the land. Why don't you partner with the farmer and take the margin on the back side instead of the front side? You don't have to rent the land. Go farm, and when you produce, we share in that operational profit, net profit, one, right? Labor, you gotta automate. There's no way where you're gonna win the labor game because there just is not enough labor, right? And water is water. You're not gonna walk away from that unless we're gonna get into the desalination business, right? So those, those things, those elements are all doable. They're all doable, right? It's just a function of speed, time. How long is this gonna take, you know? We're, we were talking, when we, we started looking at greenhouses as an educational tool for the kids, reduce water, reduce uh, pesticides, reduce labor. I went to the Big Island, Waimea, and talked to people that did the, the cannabis houses what it takes to build one of these, hermetically sealed, because that's a requirement, right? Half a million dollars per half an acre. Okay, we can do that, but what is the yield we're gonna get out of there? You gotta look at a business model, because Jason is a, is a good guy, but he's no fool, right? I've seen his operation up there, it's pretty slick. He's also in the tourist business, the visitor business, and the, the rum business, hand sanitized business, but it takes that kind of entrepreneurial spirit that's gonna win this game and make us competitive. That's what it's gonna take, right? But it's not that difficult. We just gotta get out of our own way at times. The bureaucracy is onerous. We want to prepay to the farmer, okay? Okay, well, you're gonna guarantee me this product because we're not buying grade A we can buy the grade two tomato and process it in the central kitchen, tomato paste, right? For our pizzas and our spaghettis, right? 
So you maximize the revenue for the farmer. And we're willing to prepay you for that. We're going to guarantee you revenue. Where we need to be is the farmers need to make buku bucks. Then everybody jumps in the game. But if you're going to keep the farmer poor, it ain't going to happen. Because being poor is no fun. So that's where we're going to go, or we're going to try to go. Can I add something yes. to that? I've always been a proponent of having University of Hawaii or the, some kind of school system where we create a turnkey system for farmers where we guarantee them X amount of profit in the first year. Because the, the, the one of the basic problems with farmers is they're not business people. They don't understand how to make money. But if we can give them a turnkey system, all explained out, the whole marketing program and pricing and the whole shebang, with your thing on the back end on the land cost, you know, I think it's a no-brainer. I think there's a lot of people that want to do farming, the young kids. They just don't have the means to do it you know, mm -hmm. or the knowledge. Jason's looking for 30 acres, right? 30 acres in the grand scheme of things is nothing, right? So let's have a discussion to help them. Go get, go get them 30 acres. Are you sure that procurement is not an issue still? It's not an issue. It's not an issue. Just to be clear, it, 30 acres in the world of farming is easy to find. It's the right 30 acres, right? Because if you get it too wet or too dry, then it doesn't necessarily work, even with a greenhouse. So land is out there. You know, in, in general, it's a different topic. Farmland, when I moved here 14 years ago, was fairly inexpensive. Um, now there's a big play on is farmland really land for solar panels? Is farmland really land for houses? Um, and you're seeing the differential between ag land and residential land begin to close. I say close, it's not that residential is coming down, it's ag land's gone up to the point of it actually doesn't make sense to farm or buy ag land anymore. Um, which gets to Randy's point earlier, the state still has a lot of ag land and is buying ag land to give to farmers, but land ne isn't necessarily the ultimate constraint. Um, but there's a the different conversation is, is what is the right purpose of ag land? Is it meant ag for energy, ag for food, ag for export, or ag for residential, right? And that's a different conversation for another day, but that's probably the number one farmer issue if you ask a farmer, I can't afford my land, and the question is why. Thank you, and, and it seems that, yeah, there is there is definitely other questions here, so let's try to wrap it up in terms of the Hawaii's Farm to School Initiative, right? That's what we're here to really discuss. So there was um, an initiative by former Lieutenant Governor Shantutsui, and it was called uh, Aina Pono. So, Lighty, you, you've seen programs all over. How, what, did you, what lessons can we take from that? There has been a lot of work done in Farm to School. Um, I think something that has been lacking is a plan that is community-based. In other words, communities have input because we are in a very diverse and wonderful place. Uh, one thing I wanted to agree with Randy on is that we're not going to be farming like our grandfathers. We will be farming in high-tech ways and we will be farming like our great-great-great-grandfathers because Hawaii is very unique and has sustained people here for generations and generations on some of the most high-tech or high-tech systems because technology is the application of knowledge, right? So lo'i, loko ia, starches that have sustained people here for generations, ulu, kalo, and uala need to be part of this effort. And we need a plan. We need a plan that will outlast when people leave right, and new, new folks come in, so that there is a vision and a plan, actions that people have agreed to and that we will roll out together over time. That is how we will succeed.
Mahalo. That's a, oh, we have one more question here. Critical to what, you know, Randy, you had mentioned, the need for labor and egg work workforce here in Hawaii. We work with all these kids at Castle, and they say, okay, we really love working with the land. What am I going to get paid? Right? If we don't have our answers for our kids in all our public schools and everywhere, private school as well, on why to get involved in ag or what are they going to get paid, we're not going to retain their interest. We cannot compete with the other sexy jobs that are out there where they know the monetary, you know, the, the gains that they could get by going and getting an education in IT or high tech or investment banking, right? But why? How are we going to encourage our workforce? How do we build an ag workforce in Hawaii? It starts with our kids, and we need to have those answers. By the way, Carlos Severson at Castle, he's a wonderful guy, and I, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of guys like that throughout the public schools. But really, that's a question that he's asked every day. Why am I doing this? So you got a couple benchmarks, right? One is, one is understanding what farming is all about, and that's the educational element element. Nobody just drives up and becomes a farmer, a successful one anyway. Right? Secondly is the economics. It's a tough business because the variables that allow you to be successful are not a lot of times in your control. So I'll use an example that I met Dean a while ago and we we're talking about these little carrots that a restaurateur wanted to put on their plates. Right? And so I think they formed this partnership, they were up in Kunia, and Dean tells me, farming, this guy's gonna find out that farming is harder than running a restaurant. And sure enough, and then you go, why would you waste your time growing immature carrots when you can just get them from the mainland? And that's an economic decision. So farmers, the, the new generation of farmers will have this array of, of talent not only on the business sense and the ag sense, but the technology sense. And unless they're successful and they make buku box, they're not going to stay in the game because there is no future. How are you going to afford a home for your family and send your kids to college when you're worried about whether this next crop is going to succeed or fail because of weather? So you got to really take a different look at how we do farming. And, and we're not unique. This guy's just doing all around the world. Right? We just have to adopt and recalibrate what we're doing. Then I, then I think we'll be, you know, I don't want to be negative. I think, I firmly believe this can be done. It's not that hard. But unless you've experienced farming, you know, all these guys who talk about farming, talking about farming and doing farming is two different things. Right? But no, I think we can achieve this. We've got assets across the state. We got super smart people, super passionate people, and we can make this work. And we have a preset market called the DOE, right? 45 million a year. It's not chump change. How do we get the farmers to be highly successful at what they do? We're part of the equation. We're not the only part of the equation. We're part of the equation. So we go from there. But no, we gotta make people economically successful. If not, they're not going to stay in the game. Why would you do that? Right? Thank you. You know, we have so much more that we want to talk about, but f we have to wrap it up because we're going to eat. And for those of you who have joined us virtually, mahalo nui for your questions, for sending them in, and for staying tuned. So lots more. But, you know, as Lydie said, it's going to take all of us uh, as a community to also inspire our students, right? So it, all of us play a part in this future in trying to reach that 20 to 30 goal. 2030 goal, so thank you. And how about a round of applause for this wonderful panel? And we'll call up Denise. Okay, I wanna thank Donna Lynn, again our panelists, and Randy Tanaka for joining us tonight. And I wanna thank all of you for being here. Um, I also wanna apologize to our people on Zoom. I think we were having some audio and visual difficulties, but we will make the presentation available tomorrow. Um, it is. It has been recorded, so you will get that um, in your email. I want to also thank the executive chef, Joseph Almagara, and his team here at Prince Waikiki who prepared tonight's farm to, 
school themed bento. The bentos were inspired by him and what he remembers of his school lunch days. I'm gonna put a shameless plug in for our Mika merchandise. For those of you who know me, I'm a dog mom and I have a dog named Mika and I told her in order for her to be my dog, she had to be part of Hawaii Agricultural Foundation. So we actually serve 5,000 students a year and we promote ag education in the public schools. We want our kids to be farmers. So hopefully we're part of this, this you know, this solution as well. But this cookbook um, has a story about a dog who teaches kids where food comes from. And it has 39 recipes that use a local ingredient and all of the recipes were donated by some top chefs here in Hawaii. So the, all the proceeds from the book and the merchandise goes to our ag education programs. And um, so if you have a chance and you haven't got one, please come and support us. And finally, I wanna, uh, thank Eggs Hawaii. You know, every Eat, Think, Drink for the last, I don't know, five, 10 Eat, Think, Drinks, they've generously donated eggs to all of our attendees. So all of you on Zoom, as well as all of you here tonight, will get a, a dozen eggs from Eggs Hawaii. It's Hawaiian made or kale eggs, and we'll, you'll have that in your email again tomorrow. Um, on behalf of Hawaii Agricultural Foundation, thank you again for joining us. Our next Eat, Think, Drink, for the next four eating drinks, we got Central Pacific Bank to be our title sponsor, along with Alaska Airlines. So we will be downtown at Tide Pools, and we'll, we'll have more information. But thank you again for joining us tonight. <laughs>